We're going to continue a series I've entitled Songs of Christmas. The song for today is O Holy Night. How many like this Christmas song? Isn't it? It's one of my favorites. This is without question one of the most beloved Christmas songs of all time. And yes, it is definitely one of my favorites. The song was written. Let me give you just a little bit of background about this great, great song of the season. This song was written in 1847 when a priest in France asked a poet named Placide Capot. I don't speak French. You can tell that Placide Capot to write a poem for Christmas mass that year. Capot composed the poem while he was in a carriage on the road to France which he entitled Cantique de Noel. He was so inspired by his own poem that he asked a well-known classical musician named Adolphe Adams to compose a musical score for it. The song that we call O Holy Night was performed just three weeks later on Christmas Eve in a little obscure French village. Placide Capot was an unlikely man to write these beautiful lyrics. You see, he was a wine merchant who was known more for his poetry than for his church attendance. In fact, in later years, he broke with the church entirely and joined the socialist movement of France. The music composer was also an unlikely man to write the music for this poem. Adolphe Adams was a Jew. He was of Jewish descent. He composed music to celebrate a holiday he didn't observe for a Messiah he didn't believe in. When the church leaders learned these facts, they officially banned this song and classified it as unfit for church services. But it was too late. O Holy Night had already become one of the most beloved Christmas songs in all of France. And no matter what the church leaders decreed, The French people just kept on singing it. You see, even though the composers may not have believed what they wrote, they had produced a masterpiece that was true to the gospel, and God used them to write an anointed song of the season. Today I want us to look at this song from three different perspectives. We're going to look at this song from the view from above, the the view from the manger, and our view today. So let's start with the view from above. Number one, the view from above. Verse one goes like this. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Verse 1 reflects the view from above, what that view must have been. The Father looking down, looking down from heaven, and I think he was looking with pride, don't you? Here's the father looking down with pride. You see, his plan to save all of mankind will come this day. He's sending his very best, his only son. He must also be looking down, however, not just with pride. I believe the father was looking down with anguish. Because the father knows everything. And because he knows everything, he also knows what is to come for his only son. He knows what is ahead for Jesus. He knows the suffering that lies ahead. He knows the betrayal that lies ahead. He knows the sacrifice that lies ahead. But the father looks down on this holy day and sees his son, the God of all, coming into the world. The view from above also reflects the angel's perspective. I believe the angels were looking down in celebration. You know, the first Christmas was a very busy time for the angels. It was a busy season for them. They appeared to Zechariah about his wife Elizabeth's pregnancy. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth, by the way, they are the parents to John the Baptist. An angel appeared to Zechariah because the scripture had foretold the birth of John the Baptist. An angel also appeared to Joseph and gave him instructions concerning his girlfriend, soon to be fiance, later to be his wife. She's pregnant. This is a problem. And so the angel appears to Joseph and gives him instructions concerning this. We also know that an angel appeared to Mary and telling her of her pregnancy because Scripture had foretold of a virgin conceiving and giving birth to the Messiah. And Mary asked the angel, how can this be? I've never been with a man. I'm still a virgin. And the angel explains to her that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and come upon you. And you will conceive. And you will give birth to the Messiah of the world. We also know the angels appeared to the Magi, the the wise men, in a dream, warning them of danger, guiding them on their path as well. Angels appeared again to Joseph later in a dream, warning him of danger. And then we know that the angels also appeared to the shepherds out in the field, and they announced the birth of Jesus. And then he arrives. And the angels, the the Bible tells us that the heavens were filled. They sang the praises, they proclaimed the, the praises. I'm not here to debate if they sang or if they just proclaimed. I wrote in my song that they sang, so that's how we're going to teach it today. We're going to preach it today. But I know they lifted their song, their, their voices in adoration and in praise. And they gave glory to God in the highest. They proclaimed peace on earth. And our earth needs peace today. Our society needs peace today. The world needs peace today. What is the view from above? We see the father looking down with with pride. We see the father looking down possibly with anguish. We see the angels there celebrating their view from above. You know, even the stars had a part to play on that day. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining And this is so, this is scriptural. One star in particular shone so brightly that it guided people to the holy scene, to the holy place, to the town of Bethlehem, and in fact to the very stable, to the very inn where they would be be found and where Mary would give birth to her baby that day. Let's go to that day. What is the view On that day, what is the view from the manger? Verse number two of this holy song. Led by the light of faith, serenely beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle, we stand o'er the world. A star is sweetly gleaming. Now come the wise men from out of the Orient land. The king of kings lay. Thus in lowly manger, in all our trials, born to be our friend. Verse 2 reflects some of the activity of the day that Jesus was born. Scripture tells us that there was no room for the baby. No room for the mother to have her child in a decent room. Mark and Delani have graciously agreed to be Mary and Joseph this year. And Layla is our King Jesus, our baby Jesus. Can you imagine, Mom, not having a place for the birth of your child? How many mothers out there today? No room. They go... You see, there was a census. Everyone had to go to their hometown, their town of origin, to be registered. And so all of the hotels, all of the Holiday Inns, all of the Hiltons and all the Hyatts, everything's everything's full, Mark. No place, no place, all full, no room. Finally, one guy says, well, I don't mind you going to the stable. At least it will get you out of the out of the elements, out of the cold possibly. And they go to the stable because there's no room 
for the baby. Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem for a census, as did many others. Verse number seven, and she gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a feeding trough. We have we have glorified the scene because it's a holy scene for us. But I want you to remember it's a barn, folks. And she laid her baby in a feeding trough. <laughs> it was filled with hay and straw. Because there was no room in the inn. The king of majesty was born in a lowly stable and laid in a manger. No room for the baby, but this was no ordinary baby, was it? This was God's very best. God's only son, the Bible tells us. The Messiah. The Christ, the anointed one, the savior, the king of all other kings and the Lord of all other lords. You see, on this day. Heaven's holy one. Was born. Worshipped by Mary and Joseph. Worshipped by the angels. Worshipped by the shepherds. Worshipped by the wise men. And worshipped by us today. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Max Lucado in his book, God Came Near. He wrote these words. I'd like to share them with you today. It all happened in a moment. A most remarkable moment. The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. And he who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus. Holiness sleeping in a womb. The creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows, elbows, two kidneys, and a spleen. He stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluids of his mother. God had come near. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as, as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. The hands that first held him were unmanicured, calloused, and dirty. No silk, no ivory, no hype, no party, no hoopla. Were it not for the shepherds, there would have been no reception. And were it not for a group of stargazers, there would have been no gifts. Angels watched as Mary changed God's diaper. The universe watched with wonder as the Almighty learned to walk. Children played in the street with him. And had the synagogue leader in Nazareth known who was listening to his sermons. Jesus may have had pimples. He may have been tone deaf. Perhaps a girl down the street had a crush on him or vice versa. It could be that his knees were bony. One thing's for sure. He was, while completely divine, completely human. For 33 years... He would feel everything you and I have ever felt. He felt weak. He grew weary. He was afraid of failure. He was susceptible to wooing women. He got colds, burped, and had body odor. His feelings got hurt. His feet got tired. And his head ached. To think of Jesus in such a light is, well, it seems almost irreverent, doesn't it? It's not something we like to do. It's uncomfortable. It's much easier to keep him, keep the humanity out of the incarnation, clean the manure from around the manger, wipe the sweat out of his eyes, pretend he never snored or blew his nose or hit his thumb with a hammer. It's easier to stomach that way. There's something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant, packaged and predictable. But don't do it. For heaven's sake, don't let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him into the mire and muck of our world. For only if we let him 
in can he pull us out? I like that. Listen to him. Love your neighbor was spoken by a man whose neighbors tried to kill him. The challenge to leave family for the gospel was issued by one who kissed his mother goodbye in the doorway. Pray for those who persecute you came from the lips that would soon be begging God to forgive his murderers. I am with you always are the words of a God who in one instant did the impossible possible to make all possible for you and for me. And it all happened in a moment, in one moment, a most remarkable moment. The word became flesh. Which leads me to my final point this morning. Our final perspective. Our final view. It is the view from today. Let me read to you verse three of this great song. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Verse 3 tells us why this was such a holy night and what our response should be. You see, Christmas is all about love. In fact, Jesus came as a gift of love. In this season of giving, may we never forget that the greatest gift ever given was given by God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in this, whoever believes in him, no matter what you've done, no matter your background, no matter how many times you've fallen, no matter how many mistakes that you've made. If we will just believe in Him, He will remove the guilt and the stain. He will forgive the sin. And He will become our Savior. What a gift of love. How many are thankful today for the gift of love? Thank you, Father God, for giving us this great gift. Our view from today is that we should recognize the great gift of love that the Father sent. But we should also realize that Jesus came to teach us love. Truly He taught us, the singer, the writers of this song say, truly He taught us to love. He modeled love. How to love. The gospel message is a message of love and Jesus came to teach us this message starting with loving God don't tell me that you love your neighbor if you don't love God that's the starting place for all mankind Jesus said I've come as the light of the world so that those who believe in me will no longer abide in, in darkness John twelve forty six. The Bible also tells us that people love darkness. More crime flourishes at nighttime. Did you know that? More evil happens in darkness. But Jesus came as the light of the world to illuminate the darkness, to shine His light. He's teaching us Love God. That's the starting place. If you've not done that today, you can rectify that right now. Get your life right with God. Get your heart right with God. Ask Him to come in and remove the, st- the, the, the sin. Remove the stain. Remove the guilt. You'll find that as you walk in the light, the light will heal you. I talked about this last night a bit. I resisted the light for for, uh, many years. 
And finally, I just surrendered. I stepped out of darkness into his light and the light of God healed me. Make your decision today if you've not done so. Let him heal you. Let him save you. Also, he's teaching us to love our neighbors. What is the greatest commandment ever given? One lawyer asked Jesus. And Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength. The greatest commandment ever given. And then he followed up. You should also love your neighbor like you love yourself. greatest commandment love God love people how are you doing there church how are you doing there are we loving our neighbors you know some people are easy to love like me Daisy like you and then there's some people that are difficult to love like me We can be both, right? I think it's fair to say. I'm easy to love. You get me on the right day. You're easy to love. The right time. But I'm human just like you. My point is, we're to love our neighbors. We're to love one another. The greatest proof of love. Forgiveness. Be ready to forgive because we're still on earth, folks. Forgive quick, forgive often, repeat. Forgive quick, forgive often, and do it again. Love God, love your neighbor. How about this? Oh my goodness, are you ready for this? Love your enemies? Are you kidding me? It's in the Bible. It's difficult to do. Do you know what will help you to love your enemies? The gift of the Holy Spirit. I love how Jesus described him in the book of John uh, 14, 15, 16, especially those chapters in John. Jesus is setting up his departure. I'm going to be leaving, but uh, the Father is going to send you the Helper. I love that description of the Holy Spirit because I need help. Can anybody relate to me today? I'm just telling you, I need so much help. And he sent the helper. If you find it hard to love certain people, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Stay empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit. He will help you to love your neighbor, including sometimes, maybe, even your enemies. Finally, I feel like he's teaching us to love the lost. Love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, love the lost. If we love God, we should love what's important to God. And you'll never reach the lost unless you have a love and a passion for the lost. You see, the lost will just become an irritant to you. Sometimes we as as believers, we just get irritated. We talk about how lost they are. Instead of being moved with compassion, Jesus saw the crowd. He looked over the city. and He was moved with compassion because they were like lost sheep without a shepherd. I'll just admit to you, I need help in this area. And I'm praying that 22... You see a different pastor with this regard. And I hope that we together as a church reach out to the lost. Finally, let me close this. Surely he taught us to love. And I believe that this is a love that we must share. If you're thankful for the love of God in your life, tell someone. Tell what Jesus has done that only Jesus could do. And every person in this room has a testimony of what Jesus has done. You have a testimony of how He saved you. But you have multiple testimonies of what else He has done. 
out of his great love for you. Do you know that Jesus loves you? He loves you. That's why he hears your prayers. That's why he answers your prayers. That's why he provides for you the way that he does. That's why he protects you. That's why he heals you. That's why he sets you free from the things that bind you. That's why he delivers you. Come on, somebody. Because he loves you. So we must share this love. And may we follow the shepherd's example. You see, once they verified the news of the, that the angels brought that day, they shared the news with others who then shared the good news with more people. Just come down through the years and somebody shared it with you. Somebody encouraged you. Somebody challenged you. Somebody invited you. And you gave your life to the Lord. Do you remember that day? Claudia's coming in just a moment. She's going to sing this great, great song. But just before she does, with every head bowed, if you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I need to get my life right with God. I'm ready to walk in the light. I'm ready to allow Him to be the Lord of my life. I want Him to forgive me of my sin. I'm ready to confess Him as my Savior. If that's you, lift your hand. Let me pray for you. Is there even just one? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Several hands being raised. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. That's what you need to do now. Father, forgive us. Father, forgive me. Remove the sin and help me now to live a life that would bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' mighty name.